this chapter was kind of interesting because I think uh, like the ggplot2 devs have been focusing a lot in like the very recent year. So like this year and last year, um, and I guess like last year, especially on reworking the uh, scales and guide system, like including like axes. Um, and so there were some parts of the book that I think are somewhat outdated, or at least they don't show you like the like the revamped versions that are supposed to be easier to work with. Um, I'm actually not sure what this when this version of the book came out. Do you know? I it's like the I know it's like the third edition, I think. I don't know what year, but I it does seem like it's a little bit outdated, even from some of the stuff we've already covered. Yeah, um, what I've got is the, um, I thought I had the third edition. Yeah. Okay, I can get started and then people can roll in and also put my, put my book copy up. Okay, so uh, this chapter is it's chapter 10, not 8, but I guess book down just continues the numbering like this. But chapter 10, uh, position scales and axes. Uh, so this is covering like the scale transformations of like mapping the data to um, like the x-axis, y-axis, um, and then the axes, which are like it's a term that ggplot uses that's reserved for like the actual like lines and tick marks um, that go on. So the scale is kind of like the um, underlying specification for how that mapping takes place between the raw data and um, like the positions, like the horizontal position and vertical position. And then the axes are like the, it's, the, it's like a guide. Um, it's like a legend for X and Y. Um, so you'll actually see that, um, I don't know if you actually see it, but um, in the last year or so, um, when they overhauled like the guide system, so that includes like color legend and bell legend, um, like shape legends, which we're going to cover in the next chapter, uh, they actually unified the API for legends with the axes. Um, and so like you will see that later in this chapter, we're going to do things with like guide axis, for instance, to draw like the legends for X and Y. Uh, which shares a similar syntax as like guide color bar or guide legend that you would use for non-positional aesthetics and non-positional skills. But yeah, um, learning objectives. Uh, what are the defining components of a scale? Uh, when and why does the data ever need to be transformed for a visualization? Um, and then what are the components of an axis? And what is the relationship between scale and axis? Um, and so I loaded a couple of packages here. Um, I wrote down some preliminaries as I was reading this chapter on like what parts that I thought might be missing and maybe like potential um, like jumping off points for uh, more exploration. Um, and so I just mentioned that uh, as of I think ggplot something like 3.3.0 that was like the last like kind of major update that happened last December. Um, it introduced a lot of new like functionalities and API. Um, and one of them was reworking the guide system. So again, guides are now like an overarching term that covers both axes and things like fill, color, and shape. So positional guides and non-positional guides are now like share the same like syntax, share the same API. Um, so they're handled in similar ways. Um, and then another thing that I noted here is that uh, a lot of what's being talked about here in terms of like scales and not axes, but at least scales, um, is that you'll know like this scales package, probably seen it like a couple of times. So like scales is a package that's used by ggplot, uh, but then like they kind of factored it out so that like the kind of mathematical calculations can be separated off from like the plot building mechanisms. Um, so the scales package has a lot of the functions that um, are introduced in this chapter. Um, scales as like its own package is like really interesting and it's like its own like beast. Um, and so there's actually a RStudio conference talk from last year um, on scales. So this is entirely about the scales package. 
um, it goes through like how it can be used with ggplot, but also like the fact that you can use this um, elsewhere, like for other um, like visualization systems. Um, and so this is like a talk that's worth watching. It's like 20 minutes long. Uh, and like I learned a lot from it. Um, so yeah, that's scales. Um, another thing is that there is still some revamping of the scale system going on. Uh, so uh, Klaus, who's one of the like core developers of ggplot brought up this issue uh, some time ago. Um, is it this one, 42, Um about the fact that like we have functions like xlim and ylim, you've probably seen that before. Maybe you've also seen like xlab and ylab. So those are referring to like limits and the name slash title of a scale, right? Like xlim sets the limits of scale x, uh, xlab sets the title of scale x. Uh, but those can also be set inside like the scale x continuous or scale x discrete uh, functions. So the idea with like the original the original idea with like allowing those two to be kind of separated is that you can um, build up a scale like like incrementally as if it were a layer. So you could do like x lab and then like x lim, but then like but then the um, ggplot as a system didn't haven't like made like entire complementary sets. So like sometimes um, a scale continuous function can have like an expand argument, which we'll see in a second but there's no corresponding like X expand or Y expand. And so like there's some work going on, some PRs going on uh, that try to address this issue. So you might be seeing some updates to uh, the scales API uh, in like very soon. Um, and then lastly, uh, if you saw the book, which I'll actually pull over here, uh, they actually start off talking about after stat, which like we kind of talked about last week. I didn't know that they were gonna introduce it again. Um, but hopefully, if you uh, listen to me ramble last week, you know that like after stat is like a, a function. It's like a getter uh, function, which grabs the value of count or like this variable slash column called count after the statistical transformation has taken place. Um, and so we don't have count as a column inside the MPG data set, but then we do have it after um, stat count has been applied, which is like the stat for geom histogram or a stat bin actually. In any case, um, I think they mention it here because you can make like statements about how the mappings are uh, set up without doing so explicitly. Um, and I do have like a little note here, which I guess I won't really go into detail, but I have like some, some stuff written about like after stat and what they're getting at here. Um, okay. So then the actual like content or meat of the chapter starts off talking about like numeric scales, which is like the most common scales and which is the kind of a scale that you can do the most amount of things with. Um, there is, there's like a section on limits that's apparently empty, <laughs> which was kind of weird, but I threw in like a couple like very basic things, like uh, just the fact that like, again, we have these functions like X limb, Y limb, uh, which can set the limits of an axis, but we also have uh, these like bigger kind of bulkier scale X or Y continuous functions uh, or dispute functions where you can set the limit as uh, the argument of this function. Um, and so here's like a basic plot that's like a scatter plot. Um, we can do like X limb. The first argument is the lower bound. The second argument is the upper bound. And so this says force the X axis or the uh, limits of the axis just range from zero to 500. Um, if we want to just default and fall back to the range of the data, you can use NA. So this is actually something I learned like kind of recently, uh, but you can use NA to be like, use the default of whatever you were gonna use, but then you can specify a value for um, one of the bounds and be like, start from zero, go to however much the data goes. So like max data, but then zero is the um, lower bound. Um, and again, like you can set the limits out here inside the xlim like function slash layer, um, or you can call scale x continuous and then set the limits inside the limits argument. Um, insofar as like what is the best practice, I think it makes more sense to shove everything inside scale x continuous so that like, yeah. But then like once they figure out this API of like making the building up of scales more modular, 
um, then maybe you'll see more instances of things like xlib or xlab or xexpand or um, x out of bounds, which we're also going to talk about. Um, yeah, and the, and the big idea with like the x thing again is it doesn't work right now, but the idea is you'll be able to do like lim like this plot plus scale and you could save that as a variable. And then the idea is you can override specific parts of the scale with this. Um, so if you've ever tried to do like two scale x continuous calls in succession, it will give you a warning that is overriding a previous scale. But then if these are like, factored out, then you can like modularly kind of swap in and out different parts of the scale without overriding it completely. So that's like the original motivation, but the developer haven't really, developers haven't really caught up to that um, because a lot of things were being introduced inside like scale x continuous, scale x discrete, but then the corresponding arguments haven't been refactored into uh, standalone functions. You know, I've got a quick question if you don't mind yeah. me interrupting. So I've always been concerned or I've always used caution with limits. And the mm -hmm. reason I say that is if you plot something with a value that is outside the limit that you've visualized or, you know, the scale you've, you've generated, it wouldn't show up. You're kind of almost ignoring it uh, or, or it's just not part of the, the, the rendered output. Um, would that be of a concern for any person or... Like you don't know what's in the data specifically yet. You're still in that exploratory um, discovery phase. Um, once we know what the limits of our data set would be, then we can we can scale it or or visualize it easier. Am yeah, I dude, that's a that's a great point. Um, and we will actually get to that a little bit. So like the um, yeah, so this is actually the extent of where this is like the very next section we're talking about like how to handle out of balance values. This is like the really like esoteric part. So like, I don't think like it makes sense to like, people are worried about the fact that ggplot like censors out data that is outside of the range, but then um, it's not really transparent as to like, how can you go about like not defaulting to that option? Cause that could be dangerous. Like if you're making a box plot or something, um, you could hide the fact that you're censoring values. Um, and so, yeah. So that is where the out of bounds handling comes in. So this, you're gonna see like a family of functions that you probably like never seen before if you've only been relying on the defaults. Um, so uh, I have a little note here before we get into like talking about out of bounds values, which is that scales package um, as of, I think this is supposed to be 1.1.0, but again, like a pretty recent development of the scales package um, is that they went back to all the functions in the scales package um, and they rename them such that it works better with autocomplete. Um, and so uh, here we're talking about out of bounds values, handling out of bounds values, um, and all the functions inside scales package that handles out of bounds values are now prefixed with OOB, which stands for out of bounds. Um, and so if you go to like our studio or any console for that matter, um, then you can do something like scales, colon, colon, OOB, and then you'll get all the options for out of bounds handling. Um, and so this was an intentional design that was recently introduced. Um, and it's because so that, so that like it works nicely with um, autocomplete. So actually the developers of scales suggest against doing like library scales and instead just going into like, you know, wherever appropriate um, place that you want to call scale functions in, and then, you know, maybe like OOB, and then being like scales, colon, colon, OOB, tab, autocomplete, and then use it like this uh, to make use of the autocomplete feature. Um, so that's like a little aside. Uh, but again, if you do something like, um, or like because of this naming convention, we can find out all the different options for out of bounds handling. Um, and you will see that by default, scale x continuous, which is like the default scale for like if a uh, variable that's being map mapped to x or y is continuous, um, has uh, whoops, uh, an OOB argument, which is by default set to sensor. So this is what this is. This is saying like foremost is a way of getting the arguments of a function. And then of all the arguments of the function for a continuous scale, 
the value default value for OOB out of bounds is to censor it. Um, so here's like a couple examples demonstrating this this point from the book. Uh, so here we have the MPG data set. Uh, we have the DRB, which is like drive type, like four wheel front rear, um, and then like highway miles, I guess. Um, and it's like a box plot. Um, and so by default, uh, the scales are, or the limits are set such that like you're not gonna have anything go out of bounds. Um, the limits are by default uh, set such that you can capture all values that, um, all values of the data, the entire range of the data. Um, if you want to censor, or if you want to uh, zoom in basically without um, affecting the calculation of the box plots, so without like throwing values out before the calculation of like, you know, the interquartile range and the quantiles and stuff like that, then the book suggested you use chord Cartesian. So chord Cartesian will zoom in uh, to like a range of X and Y without throwing out values. But then if you do things like Y limb or scale Y continuous limits equals blah, 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 um, then it will start removing the values and thus change the calculation of the box plot. Um, and I think this is not super apparent from here. Um, oh, I guess that's what the line here is for. Um, the, the median shifts uh, between here, which is like just zooming in, and then here, which excludes the outlier values. And so the overall median kind of goes down. Does that make sense? Um, and then of course the original plot is one where the red line is at the median. And then zooming in keeps that. But then once you use like Y lim or scale Y continuous limits equals, um, then it will exclude the outlier values. And so you get a different calculation uh, for like box plot related values. So that is the default and that is like the book suggestion. But um, again, like we, if we wanna be like more formal um, or explicit about our way of handling out of bound values, uh, we want to like use um, like explicitly handle out of bounds values with like OOB functions. So out of bounds functions and scales. Um, and so what the chord Cartesian is actually doing under the hood is it is essentially like doing the same thing as setting the limits of the Y, but then for out of bounds values, it's just keeping it inside like for the, for the purposes of the calculation. So it keeps it for the purpose of the calculation, um, like scales OOB keep does that. And so if you say, uh, scale Y continuous out of bounds should be such that you keep values that are out of bounds for calculation of like statistical summaries. Then you see that even though we have this part cut off after around 35, uh, the box plot isn't affected. I think you answered the question, but if in this code that you have written right there, if you eliminated the OOB element um, mm -hmm. argument there, then it would adjust the calculation, right? Scale yeah. Y continuous with limits does adjust, it does throw out values and adjust the calculation. Yeah. Okay. So the default, as we saw up above, is sensor. Uh -huh. So there is a corresponding argument or function from scales called OOB sensor, which is a default. And so yeah. I made it explicit here. In this case, yes, you're right. Yeah. Um, and you know this is the default, so you could take this out, but then the effect would be that it affects the calculation. Okay. So there's almost um, no like, no reason to use y lim or x lim anymore. Right, with like the fact that you can control OOB, yeah. like you can handle everything inside scale yeah. y continuous. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. That's why I kind of like having them all together. Yeah. Um, another option that you might consider is like squish. And so squish is basically like, if any values go outside of this range of between 10 and 35, then it will like squish those values such that it lies on the edges. Um, and so this also changes the data. Um, and this is like less transparent, uh, but you know, this is something that maybe you wanna do at some point. So um, I actually made the choice of like, this is also kind of hard to see, but um, these are transparent dots for the outliers. Um, and so here in this case, or let's likely look at this one, uh, when we zoom in, then we just cut off all the outliers that might like hang around up here, like it's just not shown. Um, but then when we do OOB squish, 
then what you'll actually see is all the dots that used to be up here, the outliers, they're squished to the upper bound of this limit. And so you get a lot of overlap at this point. So this point is like, if you can't see very well, this point is a lot darker than like up here. And that's because the values that go higher than 35 are squished down to exactly 35. So then you end up having a lot of overlap here. Um, and this is, for the box plot, this is kind of like a, a silent uh, transformation because box plots only care about like quantiles. Um, but yeah, and then you can use out of bounds values for, or out of bounds handling for non-positional scales. So these are like what, what you would normally call like aesthetic scales. Um, but like here is like fill. Um, if you say, if you set the limits to zero to three, then again, all of these scale arguments have the default of um, out of bounds sensor. So sensor or remove values that lie outside of these limits. So those get turned into NAs and for fill, NA values are just great. Um, and so just by manipulating fill, you get this effect where the scale, the color scale uh, applies color to values that range between one and three. And then all the values that lie outside of it, they're treated as NA. And then you get the default gray color or gray fill. Yep, and then here's squish and action. So all these values four, five, and six are above three. We used out of bounds handling squish. Um, this is the old uh, function naming, OOB underscore squish is a new function naming so that you can use autocomplete with it. Um, this is from the book and this is what's now recommended. Um, but yeah, anything outside of three is treated like three in terms of the fill scale. Uh, yes, so that is, what was this? This was out of bounds handling. Um, and then this is also like really nice if you don't use this a lot. This is something that I like almost always use in all of my plots. Um, but this thing called expansion or visual range expansion. Um, and so the idea here is you want to, it's like kind of the same idea of zooming in and out, except in this case, you're just handling like the zooming out part. So um, how much padding do you want to give to your data inside the panel? Uh, so for instance, we get like this uh, raster plot. So raster plots, you know, are kind of like heat maps. Um, this data is like a matrix. The faithful D data is a matrix. And so like each cell of the matrix is represented by a color and matrices are, you know, rectangular. And so you have a plot that's rectangular, but then you get this padding that comes by default, uh, which kind of makes it like not look as nice. Um, because like the data ranges from here to here, but then you get like this extra space for no reason. Uh, and that's because like there's default values for um, expansion. Uh, which you can control with this expand argument. Um, and so I think the default uh, for uh, continuous scales is expanding by 5% on each end. And the default for discrete scale is expanding by 0.6 on each end. Um, and there's a way of figuring out what the default is, but um, I forgot how to do that, but like that is the default. Um, but then you can override it. So the expand argument handles that, handles that kind of padding between the edges of the panel. So like the panel is like this gray rectangle, right? Edges of the panel and the data, like where the data ends. Um, and so if you remove that padding entirely from the X and the Y, then all of the space for the panel is covered by the data. Um, and then again, December 2020, uh, version 3.3.0 introduced a function called expansion, uh, which essentially just makes it a little bit more explicit what you're doing inside like the value that you're passing in for the expand argument. Um, so how this works is uh, instead of expand equals like a numeric vector, um, you would pass in this function called expansion, which can either specify uh, a multi, like how much you're multiplying the padding spy and how much you're adding the paddings. Um, and so here uh, we have an example where for the Y axis or for the Y scale, uh, we're not expanding by any amount. So this is zero times the range of the data. So there's zero padding on both ends. So that's why you get like the panel, that's the data aligned to the panel at the top and bottom, but then you still get the default padding on the left and right. 
because we haven't set anything for the x continuous scale. Um, you can also say mult equals like a not a zero value. So this is one. Um, and so what's actually happening here is you have the range of the data um, and you have paddings to the top and bottom, which is exactly the same amount as the range of the data. And so you have this rectangle and then that same height of worth of padding to the top, that same height worth of padding to the bottom. Uh, and then you can also only give uh, specify one of the, or like you can set one of the values to zero and the other to like a non-zero value. So if you do multiply zero and one, then the lower bound doesn't get any padding, but the upper bound does. So there's nothing below um, like the data, like the data is aligned at the bottom to the bottom of the panel. But then at the top, like you have as much space here as the range of y from the data. Um, and then you can of course combine it with like, you know, x and y. So here's like a kind of convoluted example, but uh, we again have that zero one uh, multiplication uh, for the expansion of the y scale. So like zero to the bottom, multiply like one times this much y range to the top. And then for the x, you're adding no padding to the left and you're adding 10 to the right. And you'll notice that this 10 here um, is interpreted on the scale. So the scale is, you know, like 60, 80, 100. And maybe this ends at like, I don't know, like 97 or something. And so it goes all the way to like 107. Um, so like you can control that with either multiple, mult or add. Um, and they're like kind of intuitive. Um, they work off of the scale that the data is currently being plotted in. Uh, so this can be kind of nice if you want to like add like annotations, for instance, um, like on top of your bars. Um, and you want it such that like you're not like expanding the limits because you, you don't really have data there. But then you want to do that for like purely like padding related purposes, like just for you to be able to plot in them. Um, and then that's where like expansion can come in handy. Mm, yeah, that's expansion. Uh, new new function from uh, last year's big update to ggplot. And then we have breaks. Um, so again, I'm using that same kind of like, what are all the functions in this package that start with the name breaks? And then, you know, they again went back and named this nicely so that it works better with autocomplete and you get a couple um, options. So the book example has uh, like a toy data and then it like plots some points along X values. Um, and the default here is breaks extended. Um, so I don't, I'm actually not sure why they like call what, what this naming convention comes from, but this is like the default. Um, and this is the same as if you didn't have this like explicit scale X continuous call with like breaks equals whatever. Uh, so this is demonstrating that this is a default. Um, and then breaks extended as a function uh, can take like how many breaks that you want. Um, and so like basically all these like break whatever functions internally um, have like an algorithm that tries to like make even looking breaks uh, according to like how many breaks you want or what kind or how much space you want between each break. Um, so that's like the general idea for these break functions. Um, so then if you say, I want two breaks, then it will be smart about how to place those two breaks and then it will place it at like lower and upper bounds. Um, if you pass null to the breaks argument, then you just won't get any breaks. Um, and then scales, if you wanna explore like how these uh, break functions uh, will apply for your data um, or just like explore them like outside of a context of a data, um, then you can actually use these functions uh, from scale called demo continuous. There's a lot of these like demo underscore functions from the scales package uh, that lets you see what your scale uh, would look like given uh, different parameters. So this is as if you had a data and an entire ggplot and then added like scale X or Y continuous to it. But then demo continuous kind of lets you skip that step so that you can like, you know, produce like reprexes and um, have small examples. So if we assume our data to range from 1,000 to 4,000, and we set the breaks to this break algorithm called breaks extended, then what does the scale look like? Then it will give you like a, uh, an example of that. So this is exactly what we saw 
like up here, right? So 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Um, and that's essentially what um, is going on here. It takes, the, it takes the range of the data and then it creates breaks. It returns a numeric vector of breaks and then that gets applied and then drawn elsewhere. Uh, but the entire purpose is, this, is just take a range of two numbers, return a vector of numbers, which are breaks. Um, and then this also replicates that like n equals two thing from that we saw about. So uh, we get two breaks here. Uh, if we set it to null, then we don't get anything. Um, and then this is, like I said, like these functions essentially like break underscore or like all these other like kind of underscore functions are what are called function factories. So function factories are functions that return functions. So breaks extended returns a function that takes two, like a, that takes a range and then returns like, you know, a, a certain number of breaks, which um, like the algorithm decides like how many that you should be returning. Uh, but then you can also set it explicitly. So this returns a function that produces two breaks. And then you pass it this argument, which is like the range of the data. And then it will give you the two breaks because this produces a function that gives you two breaks. You call this function with the data and the result is two breaks. Um, so function factories. Um, so here's some demonstration of other breaks. So um, if you have a data that ranges from one to 101, uh, you apply that to breaks extended, the default, then it will give you these breaks. Um, and then like you can have, you can use like breaks with algorithm um, and give it like how much spacing should you have between breaks. And then it will give you like breaks from zero to 110 that's separated by 10. Um, breaks pretty is another algorithm. It's like kind of a useful default. if it, it makes, you know, like pretty looking breaks. Um, and this is actually from the base function called pretty, which outputs the same thing. So pretty one to 101 um, outputs the same thing as this, at least for like this example with this width setting. Um, and then log breaks, which look nice for like log data, right? Like one, 10, 100, and 1,000. Um, there's a little uh, note I made here about debugging arguments um, inside scale that take these like function factories or like take the output of these function factories. So a useful thing about, or like a useful way of going about debugging um, arguments that take functions to then call it later is to like create a function. Like I like to call it like browser based off of like the browser function, but it's a function that calls browser basically. So browser is a function which just captures all the arguments that is passed to it saves it to this list called, save this as a list to this variable called params um, and then calls browser. And so you can see uh, what this function needs to look like and what it needs to output. Um, and so I think I should, my R session should already have this defined. Um, so if you look at this example with the default breaks, um, this is again the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 breaks. Um, and then we want to see like what, what is like the default break uh, algorithm doing. Um, then we can say like breaks equals instead of passing it like the breaks extended. Like we know that this is doing that, but like what is actually, what actually must happen under the hood of the function that is returned by breaks extended. Like this is a function that is returned by breaks extended. Um, and you can pass it like browser uh, without calling it. Uh, I have not defined it. One second. Yeah, then you will um, enter the debugging environment where what gets passed is this. Um, and so essentially, scales breaks extended um, is being passed in and then it waits until ggplot calculates the range of the data and then this function is called on the range of the data to derive the breaks and that looks like the breaks that we see right so then like we save this to like result continue and then we get back thousand two thousand three thousand four thousand 
Um, and so that's essentially what's happening under the hood. You just need a function that can deal with uh, two length numeric vector. And the scales package just has a lot of helpers that let you do things in pretty ways. Um, and then the book has a small section about like minor breaks, which essentially works in the same way. Um, but except that you would usually have more minor breaks than major breaks because minor breaks are the smaller, finer grain tick lines that show you like, you know, details of the scale. Um, yeah, and there's also functions that help you with that, minor breaks. They all start with minor breaks. Okay, so that's breaks. Um, and I think the last part is labels. Oh, second to last part. But labels are like the, the more intuitive parts, hopefully. Um, so labels are just like string manipulations. Um, and you have a bunch of functions that help you with that. So here's an example from the book. Um, if you have like AXS again, um, has in the y axis these values ranging from like 0.95 to like 1.05. Um, if you set labels or if you format labels using the scales label percent function, then it will interpret these values as proportions, turn them into percentages. So now they're multiplied by 100, and then it appends like the percent sign at the end. So it does a couple of things, but essentially like it's just formatting what the values, the printed values for the Y um, breaks look like. Um, so that's like percent, label percent. Um, you can also do like label dollar, um, but then like specify some options for it. So again, like these are function factories. So when you call things like label underscore whatever function with like X, Y, Z arguments, then it just returns another function. So this itself is a function which formats it according to these specifications. Um, again, function factories. Um, and this also means that like, you know, again, like because these are function factories, you can uh, inspect them, inspect what kind of out inputs that you should expect. Uh, so label equals browser. And so you get one argument, and the one argument is the labels. Um, or actually, I think this comes in as like numeric, yeah. Um, and then you return like a character vector, uh, which then gets replaced as like the labels that are being used. Um, and so we have these values. And then if these are arguments to this function, then we get back these character values which are then used for the y-axis labels. Uh, so again, like very, very like pretty, hopefully like very straightforward string manipulation. Um, and then so you're just figuring out what this has to look like, what this function over this data has to look like. Okay. Um, oh yeah, one last thing, um, like a practical thing that the book doesn't have an example of, but that I really like um, is like, uh, whoops this thing called uh, scales label wrap. So, you know, as the name suggests, if you have like a label that is really, really long, um, then you can say uh, format the labels of this axis, the X axis, such that you have line breaks for roughly every 30 characters, like 30 character length. Um, and so it will be really smart and not break in the middle of the word, but then it will give you roughly 30 character long, like width uh, for labels. Um, so this comes in handy a lot uh, for me because I work with discrete data a lot. Whoops. Um, I think, is that it for labels? Yes. Um, the last thing that the book talks about is transformations. So this is another one of those like really esoteric parts of ggplot scale. Um, but uh, there's a, a concept of transforming your raw data uh, before like things are applied to it. So it's kind of like what we talked about with like um, out of bounds handling. We do something with the data um, in a way that like cleans it up or makes it like more suitable for the kind of visualization that we want before we actually apply the kinds of like statistical computations on it. 
Um, so here's like one example. Um, this is uh, geom bin 2D. So it's a, it's a bin plot, but along two dimensions. So what it ends up happening is it's just like a tile plot. Um, so it bins along both dimensions. It creates like a matrix. Um, and then like it, it counts them up by default. So the statistical transformation happening here is count uh, within each of the cells. Um, after binning them by both the X and the Y axis. So you get uh, something like this for the raw data. Um, if you say, uh, you know, scale X and Y continuous and then supply um, an argument to trans, which is like the transformation, which specifies the transformation for the uh, values along the X axis, then what would happen is it will go in to the data, transform it, um, such that they're on log 10 scale and then do the counting. And so that's why this looks different from this as opposed to uh, the book actually talks about this, but I forgot to put an example here um, as opposed to if you did something like, oh, I do talk about it, but not, not for this example, but I'll show you here as well. Um, as opposed to like, if you do it outside of, whoop. Oh, that's why, okay. There was like a little error with it. I'll show you another example of this in a second. Um, but the idea is the if you set a, a transformer, which is like the thing that does the transformation um, inside like scale X or Y, then it will apply that before the statistical summaries kick in. So it does it to the data um, like very early on. But there's another option of doing the transformation after the like statistical computations has taken place. Um, and the book says that you can do that with um, chord trans, which I'll show in like just a minute. Um, so that was like an example of a log transformation. Um, you might realize, or not realize, but like one thing that um, you should know is like scale X continuous trans equals log 10 is basically the same thing as like scale X log 10. Um, I'll have to call it, whoops. And the way that we can know that is because the trans argument for this is log 10, your trans or the trans property of this scale is log base 10. The trans property of this is again, log base 10. So they're like the same thing, except this is just like a convenient like alias for scale X continuous trans equals log 10. Uh, so like when we're doing like scale X log 10, everything that's happening uh, that makes it special is because of its trans argument, which is different from the default. And the default is, I think identity. Yeah, so default is to just use the values that you're given and don't do anything with it. Um, right, so the transformation is carried out by the transformer as we saw. So transformer is like this log 10, um, like we see here. Uh, it, this is, this is um, if you want to like know what this like looks like, um, it is actually, again, just from the scales package. Uh, these ones that aren't prefixed with trans. So this is the same thing. So this, this like prints out the same thing, looks the same. Um, and then actually you can say instead of like character log 10, you can set the transformer to the output of this function factory, which returns you a log 10 transformer. And then that returns the same thing. So all of these are the same. Um, and this is like in the same vein as like what we saw last time with like, say like G on bar, you can say like stat equals count. Or like you can say like G on bar stat equals stat count, where this is just a character vector and this actually evaluates to the object. Um, but ggplot has these like nice, I guess, shortcuts for just specifying everything in character. And that's like an option for you. And the same thing is the case here. You can actually give the object or you can just say the character vector and uh, ggplot will be smart about that. Um, they briefly mentioned the fact that you can create your own transformer. This is something that if you go look at the um, talk on the scales package from RStudioConf, they'll go a little bit more in depth on. Um, but here's like a very quick example. The use case here of like needing a new transformer is that you want to combine 
Um, so here's like the data. You have like this very skewed data. You want to combine your ability to do a log scale transformation and a reverse scale transformation. So right now, like you couldn't, you can do scale x log 10, which turns it into log scale. And then you can do scale x reverse, which turns it into like reversed scale. So the so the big values come to the left and the smaller values come to the right. But how do you do both of them at the same time? Like theoretically, you should be able to, uh, but you just don't have a default transformer that does that for you. So then you'd have to go create a new one. So uh, there's this function called scales trans new, which returns a new transformation object. Um, and here's like a bunch of arguments that you need for a new transformer. And here's an example of how you would make one. So like here, I'm defining a new transformer. Uh, I give it some name. This is the same name that will be printed like this. Uh, so we call this like log 10 reverse. Um, the transformation is, it takes the log of it and then it reverses it, like takes the minus of that or like the negative of that. Um, and then it's inverse, like going from this back to the value of X, which is just the inverse function. Um, and then how do you set like breaks and minor breaks? I'm just gonna inherit that from the breaks and minor breaks of the log 10 transformation. Um, and same with like the domain. Um, you don't have to like know the specifics of this is basically if you ever come into a case where like you need to do more complicated transformations, then you can do that by using this trans new function, which is a really nice API that also, you know, allows you to inherit things from other transformations so that you don't have to start from scratch. Um, every time. So then if we use this new log 10 reverse transformer, pass it to our transformer argument or trans argument, then we get back log scaled and flipped x axis or x scale. So high values are here, low values are here. Um, and then this looks like less skewed because we, because um, this is on a log scale. Um, and then last thing from the numeric section is that um, there's a way of transforming the, there's, there's a way of applying a transformation to the plot data after the statistical transformation has been applied, statistical like computation has been applied. Um, and so I think the example is here. So this was a books example, which I thought was kind of confusing. So here's like another one um, where like we have a box plot. Here's a box plot on log scale. And then here's one where, or like here's one where the log has been applied before the calculation of the box plot. And then here's a version where the log has been applied after the calculation um, of the box plot. And the difference here is you get an extra outlier if you apply the log transformation first and then make a box plot versus if you make a box plot and then apply the log transformation. So you get like two outliers here and then you get three here. Um, and the idea is that like, if you take a log of something and like you have a distribution it like makes it a little bit narrower, like pulls everything towards the center. And so like that makes it look like there are more outliers around. Um, but then if your distribution is more dispersed to begin with, then like you kind of see less outliers. Um, so this is just to show you that there is a difference, like, um, and there is, a, there is a thing such as like doing a transformation before and after the stat intervening in there. Um, and you can see this a little bit more clearly with, again, this layer data function, right? So the data for uh, the, the one with scale y log 10 uh, will actually give you everything in log scales. But then if you're doing at the coordinate level, then the underlying data is the same, but it's just being visualized like by being stretched out. So this is like an after effect almost. Um, whereas this is like, you know, alters some fundamental thing about the calculation of the box plot. Um, yeah. Uh, there was a same section on date time, which is actually like really straightforward if, since we already covered like the basics of it. It just introduces like date time breaks and date time labels. Um, and so the same concept is there. So I thought for the purposes of the presentation, I would skip this. Um, and this part is also straight from the book, but this is like, they're talking about discrete uh, scales now. Um, and this part is just demonstrating that like what we actually call by discrete um, still like under the hood is just numeric 
And so like here we have a discrete scale, but these are also like corresponding to basically like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So if we annotate like uh, numbers from one to seven, one to seven at Y positions one to seven, then it will put these annotations at like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, because like you can still work with like numeric data on like a discrete scale because discrete scale is basically just mapping a discrete thing to like an integer scale. Um, and so you could like plot things at y equals like 6.5 and that's possible. And maybe some of you have already done this with annotations uh, because that's where it comes in pretty handy. Uh, so that's that. Um, and for discrete scales are a little bit more pickier about like limits because like, you know, if you if you're plotting discrete things and you have like a fixed set um, of things that you want to plot. And so like if you remove things from the set, then it will also remove that entire category. And so here we have only six car classes plotted, but we used to have seven. Um, so we'll just remove all of that. And then if you add a new category, then it will also add a new category, but then it wouldn't report any observations for it because you don't have any observations. Um, and if you're working with a factor that has like an unused level, so a factor that has a level, but you don't have observations for that level, then it will do this exact same thing, except it actually drops it by default. So here I set drop equals false to have this effect, but then by default, if you have unused levels, then uh, scale discrete will be smart and drop them for you. Uh, and then, yeah, for discrete scales, labeling is, you can either like give it like a partial vector that matches the original to the new. So C now becomes carrot, B now becomes banana. This is one way of specifying it. Another way is just to pass a function that takes the uh, labels as the input and then returns a new label of that same length as the output. And so like string to title takes like lowercase a, b, c, d, and then turns them into uppercase a, b, c, d. And like passing a function like that is sufficient to change the labels. Um, and of course you can use like the label underscore functions and you can use the same like debugging strategy to figure out what the input looks like um, and what kind of function you want to use to change the output. Uh, yeah, and then like very, very briefly about guides, like they exist um, and they can be set in like two different ways. One is like inside this guides function, uh, you can say the guides for X should be like guide axis. Um, and here guide axis has this nice argument called n dot dodge, uh, where you can specify like the level of dodging that you want for your X axis label. So if you have um, like long, labels for your X and you also have a lot of them, then sometimes you want to dodge them like vertically um, so then they don't overlap. Um, you can also set angles for them. Uh, and that's the extent of what guide access can do. Uh, but people have made like other guides. So like uh, GGH4X um, by Ton Brand um, has this guide called guide access nested, which allows you to create like this kind of a guide system. Um, and so he was actually one of the first people to like take advantage of this new uh, guide underscore uh, API from like the last year. So I think his package is kind of like the only one so far that has extension points for guides, especially access guides. Um, and you'll notice that in this case, I've specified the guide inside scale X discrete. So that's another option. So you can either do it inside guides or guides X equals something or scale x something guide equals a guide. Um, and there's advantages of doing one or the other, um, or actually, I'll just type it in here. Um, but the advantage of using guides is that you can not only specify like the guide for x and y, but also like fill and like line type and like whatever. And then these would normally be like guide legend. And then these would be like, guide axis. So this is like what I was talking about in terms of like the new development for the guide API. It um, unifies the two between positional guides and non-positional guides. And we would usually, we had, we had usually been calling them, calling the non-positional non-positional ones legends and positional ones axis 
or axes, but now they're unified under this term called guide and they share a similar API. So like guys X has like title and like order and position. I think this also has like title um, direction instead of order, or it does have order, uh, but it also has like direction um, and like some other stuff. Yeah, so they, they all look kind of pretty similar now and you can handle everything about guides and legend and axes inside this guide function um, or inside the scale. Um, yeah, I am out of time, but there was like a, this is a book example on bind things. Bind is like a weird like mix between like mapping a continuous variable to like a discrete scale. Um, and so that's why it had its own section. One thing you might be interested in from here is that if you ever made like histograms and you were kind of like weirded out by the fact that like the breaks like are at the middle of the bars, which is kind of weird if you think about like histograms is like binning things up, like you can't really tell the the lower ends and the upper ends, upper ends of the bins. Um, you can like use a bin scale and then a bar, and then it will tell you like the intervals, like intervals, quote unquote, uh, for each bar that you're counting up within the bins. Um, and then yeah, they had a last section on limits, which kind of went over my head um, oh. because I didn't look at it too carefully. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was gonna say I'm supposed to present next week. But like, if you needed extra time, that's fine because I'm actually supposed to do next week and then the second or third. So yeah, if you wanted to finish up with bend and limits next week, that's fine. And okay, then I'll I can start talk a when you, bit. yeah, yeah, for sure. The package is mm -hmm. browser part of is that GG Trace? Is that a GG Trace? Oh, browser oh. is just a function that I define. So it's just oh. a wrapper around. Where did I do this? Uh, it's just a wrapper around the base browser function, uh, which like invokes the debugger. So this is a function that takes any number of whatever arguments, like this is the classic use of the dot, dot, dot. Yeah. If you wrap dot, dot, dot inside a list, it will just like turn that into a list and any arguments that go in the dot, dot, dot is now like elements of a list. And so that's saved to param so that you can inspect it later. And then you call the browser to like, go in and intervene at that point. So yeah, base R. Yeah, other thoughts or? No, I just wanted to say thank you. Sorry I missed last week, but I'm gonna check out the video and thank uh, you yeah. for the presentation. No problem. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think that's a wrap, right? Ryan, do you want to close? <laughs> uh, uh, sure. Thanks, everybody. Uh, hopefully, Priyanka will be back for us next week. And in the meantime, we can catch up on the Slack. So thanks, everybody. Okay. See Thank ya. you. Bye. 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 Bye.